Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the nature of money. My guest is Daryl Robert Schoon, a internationally recognized financial analyst. He is the author of Light in a Dark Place, The Prison Years, which we'll be talking about. He's also the author of a novel called You Can't Always Get What You Want. Daryl is an old friend of mine. I've known him since 1971. Welcome again, Daryl. Thank you, Dr. Mishla. I, I've always called you Jeffrey, but here we are in a different <laughs> setting, and I, I'm not going to waste the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> well... We already, in our previous interviews, talked about uh, the time when you were in prison and mm -hmm. you received a download, unexpectedly, mm -hmm. uh, that seemed to foretell the, the financial events and, and your ability to forecast those events, particularly the crash of 2008, uh, gave you an international reputation. But for um, the benefit of our viewers, let's, let's go back to that moment when you were in prison, and, and this information seemed to come to you? Um, I, it was 1991. Um, it was a, 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 probably in September. And uh, I was six months short. For those of you who haven't been in prison, you know what that means. Six months short means you're going to get out in six months. <laughs> I'm just trying to... <laughs> Yeah, I was six months short. And um, I'm, I'm at uh, Terminal Island Federal Penitentiary. It's a level four or five. It's a pretty high level security prison in Southern California. And um, I'm sitting there, and these words came to me. I mean, they just came to me, Jeffrey. Okay? And they were this. In times of expansion, it is to the hair the prize goes. Quick, risk-taking, and bold, his qualities are exactly suited to the times. In times of contraction, however, the tortoise is favored. Quick only to retract his vulnerable head and neck, his is the wisest bet when the, when the slow and sure is preferable to the quick and easy. There comes a time, however, when neither the hare nor the tortoise is the victor. This is the time of the vulture. And the vulture feeds neither upon the stored-up wealth of the bear or the pastures of the bull, which lie buried beneath the rubble of economic collapse. The vulture feeds upon the blind denial and ignorance of the ostrich. The time of the vulture is here. Now, when those words came to me, I was not expecting them. They were so shocking, I wrote them down. Mm -hmm. All right? And I basically showed them no one, except somebody was in there. He was a Republican. <laughs> not my... He was, he was into money. Mm. And in fact, he's in for counterfeiting. His fortunes had fallen and he, his nephew ran a pretty plan, much to his wife's chagrin. Mm. He took this shortcut and I showed it to him. It shocked him because here we were in 1991 in prison and I wrote something very, very, it was clearly financial. Mm -hmm. There was no sign of an economic perturbance anywhere on the horizon. And yet these words came to me mm -hmm. and I wrote them down. That's all I did. Yeah, in fact, 91, you could say, was the beginning of the period of irrational exuberance. It was the very beginning. Yeah. You're right. They had sort of recovered from the chaos of the uh, 70s and 80s. Reagan had come in during the mid -19, early 1980s and turned on the spigots. All right, so money started flowing into markets, which made stock prices go up. Yeah. So these words come to me clearly talking about an economic cataclysm that we we'd never experienced. Okay. Perhaps we've been through the 30s. We're about, oh, no, this again. Yeah. Not that. Yeah. So I got out of prison, and um, I didn't think much of what it I, I wrote it, so it was in my notes, all right, mm -hmm. this little. But at this point in, in your life, I know you were dealing with some high-level bankers and other people in prison, but you hadn't a, a background in finance. Not at all. 
Yeah. My, my, my degree was in uh, political science. Mm-hmm. I had one year of law school before I dropped out and became a hippie. And as I made the joke before, it's not a good sign when hippies talk about money, <laughs> which we are today, both you and I. Yeah. All right. And, um, well, let me okay. just mention, since you okay. brought it up, for the benefit of our viewers who probably don't know, I did have another life oh, totally. uh, as, yeah. as a, a licensed commodity trading advisor. I think the term is certified. Really? Right? The, yes, I was a commodity trading advisor and an active trader. I published the handbook for people uh, participating in the uh, million dollar stock market challenge uh, by CNBC. Uh, this is about 12 years ago, and I had many appearances on CNBC as a <laughs> as stock great. picker. This is great. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the viewers here of New Thinking Allowed have no, no idea. idea of that side of you. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I've actually, uh, since I met, um, a mentor in about 1999, Dean Brown, who was making a lot of money in the financial markets and, uh, one day took me aside and said, Jeffrey, I want to teach Show you. Show you some. Yeah. I, I've got bit by the bug. Of course. And, okay. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for that little mm-hmm. bit of information. So I, I am actually quite interested in, 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 in money and finance. Yes. But, but even more so in the metaphysics of it. Yes, everything is metaphysical, ultimately, or it can be seen from a metaphysical mm-hmm. standpoint. Yeah. So there I was, I get out of prison, and I'm living in San Francisco, and I became obsessed with the Great Depression for no reason, for no reason, for no apparent reason at all. Mm-hmm. And I turned to Martha and I said, what am I studying the Great Depression for? I mean, I was like the, the question, where did the money go? That was a very simple question that came to me. And that made me start thinking about money. Most people don't think about money. They use money. They have it, but they never think about it. They never think how it's created, where it comes from. And neither did I. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I was into money, but I wasn't into thinking about money. Yeah. And I turned to Martha during the 1990s. I said, what am I doing thinking about this stuff? All right. And I, I got I started reading about the Great Depression. I had no axe to grind. I was neither a left wing. I not. I was not an ideologue. I was, I was n- neutral about money. I had. I hadn't gone to college. I had not. No, I'd gone to college, but I'd never studied economics. Mm-hmm. You, you couldn't call me a Keynesian or a Friedmanite. That's where the left and right had coalesced. Yeah. All right. I had. No, I know. I, but I. You know, like remember when I told you when I wanted to know what the meaning of life, what was going on. I didn't know the meaning of life. I said. What's going on here? Yeah. Something's going on, and I want to know it. Well, that was a sort of the equivalent of my study of money. What is this? Why did this happen? All right? And I tell you, one thing led to another. Mm-hmm. All right? I made the acquaintance of Professor Antal Fekete, all right, who was a Hungarian, um, brilliant Hungarian. There's a, the Hungarians are a very brilliant race of people. Bartok and <laughs> mathematicians, all this. There's this history. And, Antal was like that. He, he he was a professor of mathematics, but he was steeped. His hobby was money. He had read Ricardo, Adam Smith. He had read all the classics of money. He studied it, all right? And I, fu- I found him on the web in the late 1990s. And he said something that was absolutely stunning about what would happen when things got with a crash happened. And he, he called it to a T. He said they would lower interest rates down to almost nothing, but the, the money would not get into the economy, which it was intended to do to bring the demand back up. It got s- sideswiped to the banks who took advantage of the low uh, interest rates that they, they were only they were given from the Fed. They kept the interest rates to Main Street high, all right, because they were afraid of us going broke. Mm-hmm. And they took, they arbitraged the cheap money and bought bonds at a higher rate of interest and they're paying the, the Fed and made bank in the middle. Mm-hmm. And when he said that, I thought, wow, not many economists made that observation. So he, he we started corresponding, Antal and I did. Mm-hmm. All right. And I, and I told you this before. I said, yeah. I remember his first email to me. I write him this just polite letter. And he I get this letter. This goes, this message back, what is your interest in these matters? I mean, it was, <laughs> that's a daunting yeah. response. Mm-hmm. And I didn't answer it. Because I was a hippie with no very little money, but I was obsessed with this area that was now open up to me. Well, I kept reading. Plus, uh, Benjamin, our son, had graduated from MIT. All of his friends had moved back from Boston. They were living in San Francisco in the 1990s. The dot-com bubble was 
rolling. No, it was. Everything changed. Yeah. Right? So I'm watching this, and then it blew up in the year 2000. Mm-hmm. I watched it blow up, and I knew it was going to, because of what I'd done with the Great Depression, seeing the buildup of capital, what drove... Everybody has a view of the markets, like God, or like reality. Everyone has a damn view, you know? But their view is determined by either a story they've been told and are trying to retell it to convince themselves they're, they're right, but they've never questioned it. They're just, they're either Catholics or Muslims or they're libertarians or, or, or gold standard people or, you know, mm-hmm. or Friedmanites or Keynesians. They just have a, in my, my, I should calm down. They just have an attitude and a point of view that they're trying to sell. Mm-hmm. But they haven't asked fundamental questions. Some have. There's a lot of smart people out there. There's a lot of aware people that I didn't know was there. When I started writing, I started getting letters from very insightful people on this planet about what I was writing about. Mm-hmm. All right. So anyway, when the dot com thing blew up in the year 2000, it made total sense to me. It it made total sense. Mm-hmm. So I pretty much knew we were headed for an even bigger one. All right. And that was the, my mindset when Marshall, my friend from law school, put together the Positive Demon Network, a group of, he called high achieving, out of the box thinkers. And Martha and I were members and we met four times a year. And he introduced me to a, a, uh, a banker. I, mean, I told, talked to him about the previous program, John Body. Very few people know about John. Uh, John, at the age of, uh, right out of college, was made, he, Kidder Peabody hired John and made him a vice president. Mm-hmm. Right out of college. All right, Wall Street banking firm. Nine years later, he's a managing director of the uh, bond trading unit in London. At the age of 30. Mm-hmm. A year later, he's running a proprietary multi-billion dollar hedge fund, a bond trading fund for Credit Lyonnais, A, one of the major French banks. Mm-hmm. His returns are so... Extraordinary. He's put into the Bond Traders Hall of Fame by Credit Magazine. The 50 top bond traders of all time. Very few people know about John. All right. Well, he was part of this group. And Marshall was a friend of his. I didn't know him at all. And Marshall told me, he says, you know, Daryl, John's really worried about the economy because I've been screaming at Marshall about this stuff for you. Marshall hated hearing it because he's wants to believe it's, he's an optimistic kind of guy. He's an Aries. He didn't want to hear my stuff, yeah. but he liked me and he knew. I was studying this, all right? So he puts me together with John, and he said, John also is worried about the economy. And I thought, he's not worried like I am. You know, I'm Dr. Doom. Martha would say, when we went to parties, Daryl, don't talk about this. <laughs> People want to have a good time. <laughs> and I go up in a tear about the stock market. People start moving away. Mm-hmm. You know? I was obsessed. Yeah. Truly obsessed. Mm-hmm. But because John was such a guy guy, I mean, his, his financial provenance was, I didn't even know it then. Half of what he had done at that age, mm-hmm. you know? But I knew that I couldn't just say, you know, John, we are going to hell in a handbasket. So I started writing a paper. It turned out to be 148 pages long, all right? And it was predicting an economic collapse, and I went into inflation, deflation, the role of the role of credit, the role of, of central banking, the role of gold, what is money, the whole thing. And I put it out there, and I presented this at one of the PDN's meetings in uh March 1st, night in 2007. Mm-hmm. And I, now, I, be, before we go any further, okay. I think it's worth repeating for the benefit of our viewers that uh, prior to this, you had had a session with, uh, I believe it was Hoyt Robinette, Rob, Robinette who, si- who also predicted you were going to become, uh, uh, how did he say, you're going to have lots of students? He, it, two, two years before this, in mm-hmm. 2005, we went to see a psychic, and mm-hmm. I wasn't into this. I, 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 I knew enough to know that there was something there. I didn't disregard it, but it was never in my field of interest. Yeah. I wasn't interested in, in mediums or psychics or spiritualism at like, all. Yeah. All right? It's like mm-hmm. Halloween. Yeah, yeah. People get into that. I don't. Mm-hmm. And we'd gone to see this psychic out of the blue, and he, he said, uh, I told, you know, he's got my little piece of paper. He's holding my hand. Never met him in my life. And he goes, uh, you're a teacher. I go, no. And he goes, you teach? And I go, no. And then he goes, well, you know things that other people don't know. And I said, everybody thinks that. But I have no voice. I have no audience. At that time in my life, which was 2005, I was 50 years old. 50 years old. And you know some of where I've been through. Yes. A lot of where I've been through. All right? But it was 
almost nobody knew that. I'd gone from law school to the Haight Ashbury to jail to presidential invitations, one of the uh, trading in China. I was on, you know, I, I, to a 10 year prison sentence, to meditating, to getting this down, this insight about economics, a, a spiritual experience, uh, many things that happened. I'll say, <laughs> yeah. And you were, every once in a while you would check in. In 2008, I get an email from you because you, you say, Daryl, he said, I just was reading, I said, I've been a subscriber to Richard Russell's Dow Theory letter for years. It's on money. Yeah, Richard Russell was a very highly esteemed uh, Dow Theory analyst. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. The oldest newsletter, investment newsletter based on the Dow yeah. since the beginning. Yeah. And I didn't know this. In fact, mm-hmm. I didn't know he even quoted me. Mm-hmm. All right? And you said, he just quoted a Daryl Shoon on money. Is this you? <laughs> now, I could take your surprise and understand it. Uh-huh. I knew what, what you knew more about me than anybody else. And financial analyst and expert on money was not one of the things by my name. Right. At all. That's right. It didn't even look like it would even be there. Okay? Yes, but things change. But things change. And they did. Mm-hmm. So, what had happened was, is that I'd gone to see, we'd gone to see the psychic, and, and, and I said, I have no voice in this world. No voice. This is 2005. And he said, this will soon change. People will begin seeking you out. All right? I didn't know this guy from Adam. All right? The next year, I began writing my paper because of John Body. Mm-hmm. I just couldn't say to John, I agree with you, it's going bad. He had, I knew he was real. Yeah. So I started writing this paper. It turned out to be a 148 page analysis of the U.S. and global economy, money, gold, the markets, et cetera, et cetera, and why we were headed towards a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. I posted this in, I I published this, I presented this in a paper to the Positive Deviant Network on March 1st, 2007. Okay. What happened then is I got a website. SurviveTheCrisis.com, and you can go there. It's mm-hmm. there. www.SurviveTheCrisis.com. It sort of tells the story about this book. Mm-hmm. And 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 I, the guy who assisted me in putting the he we we paid for his get rich scheme, and we paid a thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars. And let me tell you, Doctor Bishop, it was worth it. Mm-hmm. It was worth it. He was in the early days of the internet. He, he knew a lot about internet marketing, and he said, if, he says, "If you don't like what I say here, I'll give you your money back." And we didn't ask for our money back. Mm-hmm. We did exactly what he said. We were going to sell the book for thirty dollars. We're hippies. We don't even have stocks, you know. And he said we're selling the book for. The-. He said, "Listen, if this book is worth anything, you've got to charge more than that. You're going to save people fortunes." So we sold the book on a PDF download for eighty dollars. We sold the copy for a hundred, you know, around the world. Mm-hmm. And I, my website got ten thousand hits in twenty to, in two months. From around the world. Mm-hmm. By the time it was over, not over at its peak, we people from 145 countries had plugged in to see. And I was writing articles. I started writing articles in 2007, and I got posted on gold and silver and investment websites around the world. Mm-hmm. I went, that's where you found me. Yeah. That's where Richard Russell found me. Yes. Richard Russell found me there, read what I wrote on money, and put it in his newsletter, and that's how you found me. That's correct. All right? Yeah. So by 2008, I was out there. You were. All right? Big I, time. I, I, at that time, I, I, and you've been subsequently. Yes. I've sort of been far less active mm-hmm. because I've said my piece. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not a – I've been a very poor apostle for Jesus. <laughs> After I said my piece about Jesus, I basically shut up. <laughs> I would have quit talking. If you don't agree, I'm not going to try and chase you. Mm-hmm. All right. So I write very little. Yeah. And I'm every once in a while somebody will call me up and want my want me to opine mm-hmm. about today's repo you, market. You've spoken at various conferences. Yes, and I've spoken at various money, conferences, which my, is how I saw you again, again. At, in 2014. Yes, but I know about money. And for example, money is a medium of exchange. Started out very rudimentary as a medium of exchange between people. Somebody had something, and somebody wanted something of somebody else, and and it, it was rather than give you my cows for your wheat harvest, it was a it was a medium of exchange. Mm-hmm. It had value and was a medium of exchange. 
All right. And the more developed the society was, the more money was in use. Mm-hmm. And it was always a medium of exchange. It started out with coins. It started with coins. Yeah. And, and basically silver coins or copper, mm-hmm. like penny, silver, you know, they had value. Mm-hmm. And they would hand them, and the government sort of said, this is, this coin's worth that. Okay. Well, it all changed, changed radically. In two, in, we're almost a thousand year anniversary of paper money. This is 2019. In 2014, five more years, it's going to be the 1,000 year anniversary of paper money. I mean, 24. 24. Yeah, 2014. 20, 20, 2024. 2024. Yeah, 2024. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a thousand year birthday of paper money. And what happened was this. In China, they had a shortage of copper coins in the province of Sichuan, home of Mapo Dofu, that great Sichuan food dish. All right? They had a shortage of coins. So some Yobo, maybe like me, gets this bright idea. Well, copper coins, listen, we'll just make lead coins. They'll be worthless, but you know, at least we'll have some coins. So somebody else thought that was a good idea. So the provincial government printed, made lead coins to substitute, you know, to, to make the up for copper coins. Well, lead was so much heavier and worth so much less. You couldn't even carry the amount of lead to buy an equivalent of salt. Mm-hmm. So pretty soon, people started depositing their lead coins at coin shops and getting a receipt. Okay? Mm-hmm. A thousand lead coins. Mr. Mishlow, I like that horse. 500 lead coins. Well, I only got a thousand here. I'll give you two horses. <laughs> so, piece of paper, uh-huh. certifying a receipt of mm-hmm. coins. That was the first line of paper money. Uh huh. Well, what happened was this. Human nature being as it is, the owner of the coin shop realized his receipts were buying things out there. It was his coin shop. How would people know the difference between the receipt for 100 coins issued to Mr. Shun for 100 lead coins as the issue to Mr. Kwan for 100 lead coins? They don't know it. If issuing a receipt to himself. Yes, mm-hmm. or to anybody. Yeah. He can take that receipt, go and buy this another horse from you. Which banks have been doing ever since. <laughs> Chinese did it first. Okay. Chinese did it first. Uh huh. So what happened is, all of a sudden, human nature being what it is, there were tons of receipts floating around Sichuan province, and all hell broke loose economically. Mm -hmm. Prices exploded. The central government had to come down, lock the place down, declare these things outlaw, and they sent in a team to find out what the hell happened in Sichuan. Mm hmm. They go back and they do the report. The central government says, paper money is now outlawed, except for us. <laughs> We're the only ones that can issue paper money. They issued notes representing um, uh, strings of copper coins, mm-hmm. which was the, which is when they were short of the lead coins, copper coins. This is where so many copper coins. The notes, however, this is how devious they are. There was a reason why they saw the leverage. The notes were backed by... 27% copper coins. The rest was gas. <laughs> it was bullshit. Mm-hmm. All right? Mm-hmm. Because, as they say, oh, you can take these papers paper and turn them in for coins anytime you want. Right. Knowing that only a small percentage... Was actually there. Yeah. But they knew most people were going to turn... They assumed most people were going to turn it in. Right. So they knew human nature. All these people, Unless there's a run on the bank absolutely, or something. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is only in 10, th- in 1024. And mm-hmm. there were no banks. There were no... There was no credit and debt. There was no financial infrastructure like we have today. Mm-hmm. But no, they went to 27% immediately. All right? And the yeah. same damn thing. <laughs> printing, explosion of price. And the dynasty fell. What happened over the next 500 years is six dynasties tried it and collapsed. And, and it's happened all over the world. Yeah, there's, since there's then. always this tendency uh, for governments when they're short of cash to, to de- print. debase the currency. Well, the, so what happens is, is that five dynasties fell over the next five, five, six dynasties fell over the next six, 500 years. And money, and in 1661, the Chinese outlawed paper money. Mm. No more. 33 years later, 33 is sort of a metaphysical number, it reappears in England. Paper money 
reappears in England as banknotes issued by the new Central Bank of England called the Bank of England. Mm -hmm. Now, how did this happen? Well, clearly, they've been watching what's going on around, you know, they've been thinking about this stuff. And, and King William III owed a huge amount of money because of his wars with his relatives on the continent. Huge amount of money. Yeah. So the wars are very expensive. Very expensive. And they're not profitable. Yeah. Okay. Until when they, except sometimes they are. So what happens is William owes all this money and William Patterson, um, a Scotsman, Scottish, Chinese, Jews, they're great at money. Scotsman comes down and makes a proposal to King William. And he says, listen, we will pay off your debts. We'll pay off your debts. Okay. We'll float you a loan, 8%. Pay off your debts, all right? On one on one condition. He goes, "What?" He said, "You give us the right to issue um, letters of credit, interest bearing letters, interest bearing letters of credit." Sounds neutral. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's not a banker. He, he doesn't know what this. In fact, the things didn't even exist before, except in rudimentary forms among money changers. Mm-hmm. So he agrees to it. Why? Because he's going to get his debts paid off. Yep. <sighs> I mean, I can go to war again. Now my debts are clear. I can borrow more money and go to, you know, and go to, go after France again. That's all he cared about. Mm-hmm. Well, the bank, William Patterson and his boys, have now the right to issue these circulating letters of credit, which is not money. But they did it anyway. Mm-hmm. They liberally interpreted the term letters of credit and debt, issued money, English pound notes, in the form of loans from the bank to the populace. Yep. That's how they created money from their bank for the first time. In, in other words, instead of gold being the basis or, or silver or, or some metal that has a positive con- value, positive value, the money was backed by debt. Well, it was backed by gold and silver, really. Yeah. But it was issued as debt. Uh-huh. So it was backed by reserves of the Bank of England for their sterling and for the gold. They did have they uh-huh. did have the metal. Uh-huh. But like the Chinese, they knew if push came to shove, they were never going to get called on it. Yeah. But they did. Yeah. Let me tell you, 1990, they did. All right? They did. But this is 1695, mm-hmm. a long time before. So they got the right. It was, it was now backed by, it was still backed by precious metals, but it was issued for the first time in the form of debt. All money from central banks is just a, rep- a, 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 a coupon representing debt floating around that, that you can buy things with. It's a mm-hmm. trading coupon issued in the form of debt. Mm-hmm. The, the central banks loan money to commercial banks. They give the money and the commercial banks borrow this and say we're going to pay, pay so much to, the, to the, the, the central banks and loan money to you, me, the businesses, everybody, and to the government. Mm-hmm. And that's how bankers have lived ever since and at the top of the pile by everybody else's productivity. All they do is they've They've arbitraged the quote right to issue to circulate, <laughs> circulate, you know, financial instruments in the population. They turn it into money, and because everybody loves money on loans, they don't care because nobody's got right. it. And and from their point of view, to be fair to them, they they would say we are contributing to the economy because we are providing liquidity. Oh no, of course they would say that. Mm-hmm. The best among them would say that, and so would the worst. Even when the worst know they're they're hanging society, they're sending us into debt that at untold levels. Mm-hmm. They are, you know, but and their excuse: oh, we're providing liquidity; people who need it. Mm-hmm. All right, sure you are, but at what cost? And what's your motivation? All right, it's it's the the first paper money that reached Europe was from Marco Polo. The uncles had gone over to trade with Genghis Khan, yeah. and as soon as they hit the borders, the Chinese go, uh, what's this? They had gold and silver, because mm-hmm. they brought it from Venice. They're going to trade, buy all this stuff from the East. And they said, oh, we're going to buy stuff. And the Chinese go, you can't buy anything here with that stuff. What? No, no. You need this. And they had them all this paper money, scra- you know, mm-hmm. scratching written on dos- or paper, you know. And they traded them. And sure enough, they could buy whatever they wanted. Whatever they wanted with these pieces of paper. Why? And they were stunned. That when they wrote back, when, when, when Marco Polo was in jail, he told what happened to his, to one of his friends in jail after he got back from China. Cause he's an older man now. Mm-hmm. And there's two things that they never believed that it was tale. That they burned rocks for heat. It's cool. Yeah. They burned rocks for heat and they used paper with plenty for money. The West didn't believe both of them. 
Now, when Genghis Khan heard about this great leader in the, in the West, the Pope, he sends a gift of all these paper money to the Pope as, hey, big guy, mm-hmm. here's a gift from another, perhaps even bigger guy. All right? Mm-hmm. This is, we're friends, big yeah. guy. Here's all this stuff. When this stuff reaches Venice, reaches the Pope, the Jesuits are sitting there looking at this stuff, and they go, this is the work of the devil. Whatever this, this is the right of the devil. They were right. It was paper money. Mm-hmm. It was the work of the devil. In my opinion. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because it's, it, it is enslaved people. It is, it is not... It, it was always inserted as a device to fool and to, and to obfuscate. In China, they issued it as a device so the, the government would have, could spend more than it had. Okay? Mm-hmm. They, 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 they were backed by 27% coin. They spent 75%. Yeah. All right? And they, and they drove the state into bankruptcy. So the state used it first as a way to get over on everybody else. But wouldn't, wouldn't you say this, Daryl, that even though several dynasties went under and, and states have gone bankrupt and businesses have gone bankrupt, overall, let's say for the last thousand years, the global economy has been growing. No, okay, let's reach that. It is true. I've done a lot of research about money. Mm-hmm. That prior, that it, at the time when they started issuing paper money, there was a huge dearth of credit, yeah. of liquidity. Mm-hmm. The, the, the industrial revolution was like, it was like a baby about to be born, yeah. which was going to demand, which could use a whole lot of capital. And the goldsmiths and the bankers were not about to loan this shit out to people that they didn't know, mm-hmm. that they didn't trust. So I would say it was fated to happen. It was meant to happen. And many things happened because of it. Great things. We've destroyed the planet. We have basically turned this planet into a cesspool, into a toilet, because of what we've done. Now, granted, you and I are going to the bathroom with with heat on and nice music and stuff like this, and we've made progress. Humanity has progressed. But the the, the fundament of money mm-hmm. is 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 a fraud. It's a fraud. It's a Fraud, Jeffrey. Now, Adam Smith, when he wrote the nations of wealth of nations, he said, "This is." He said, "We don't know whether it's good or bad, but we think it's you know it's going to." We now have under this system, mm-hmm. the richest people have everything, and they keep getting richer. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's not because they work harder. No, it's not because they got better lawyers. It's because of the system. Mm-hmm. Now, so they say they can fix the system. You can't fix the system without changing it. And you can't change this system. This system is credit and debt issued from a central bank that benefits the bankers. All right? I know this. I look at it. I see this. I, I mean, I know this stuff like the back of my hand now. And and I, I don't talk about it because it's so it's so hard for people to get. They don't understand it. All right? Money. They really don't understand it, all right? And, 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 and they don't understand that when debt is issued at money, as, as credit in the beginning, it's wonderful. Things expand. Yeah. Things expand. Things expand. And L- England expanded for 150 years. Why? Because they could go to war on credit. England was the only country at that time that could go to war on credit. The bankers would give them whatever they needed. They go knock off a country. They call it free trade. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they invaded Turkey because Turkey had a closed trading system. Well, screw you. Don't call this free trade. It's one country invading another country and taking them over. It's imperialism. But the British gussied it up. We are ambassador of free trade. Free trade meant you had to accept my paper money. I had leverage over you that you couldn't do yourself. Because he who prints the money has the power. Mm-hmm. So they showed up. The, the, the English, and basically their navy, their navy was a mercenary thug brigade. All those little blue things and HMS pinafore and singing songs. It was a, it was a gang of thugs mm-hmm. that went around the world, knocked over countries, and enslaved them. Took over China, as I recall. Tried to. Yeah. Tried to. This is what happened. England was the crown jewel. They knocked over the they knocked over India and took it over. All right? Now, there's the English. This is like Dharma. This is cultural Dharma. The early 1700s, the, the British are rolling. They're rolling. 
All right, they're rolling, and they've they've absorbed India, and there's China, and they wanted China. Why? Because the English had now so much money, they were they loved tea. China makes a lot of tea.、Mm-hmm. They love silk. All the silk came from China, and they love fine porcelain. The Chinese did fine porcelain.、Mm-hmm. Okay,、oh. so they roll into China, and they tell the Chinese, "Hey, we like this stuff." Chinese, you know, I, I know. Sure, we'll sell it to you. And the British go, "Well, here's our money." And the Chinese go, "What's that?" And the British go, "What's、well, money?" British pound note came from China originally. Yeah, but. Now that it's been outlawed,、mm-hmm. okay, for fifty years, yeah, okay, over fifty years.、Mm-hmm. So Chinese don't. At that time, the money in China was circulating silver ingots,、mm-hmm. not even issued by the state. When they finally collapsed, when the financial system collapsed, they went back to pure tr- silver trade, pure trade in silver, basically.、Mm-hmm. Okay. So they show up with this paper money, and the Chinese go, "Screw you."、Mm-hmm. And Chinese guys, they go. Well, everybody else takes it. We're not the Chinese. You know how stubborn they are. They are really stubborn people. So the Brits go back and they start buying this stuff. All right. How with, with, with silver? With silver. They had to. The、yeah. Chinese had it. They wanted it.、Mm-hmm. Now the, the flow of silver, <coughs> which had rolled from the from America into Spain, basically. All right, because of the conquest. Of the you know, well, the, the, what was happening is the British were being forced to buy silver on the open market in Europe to take it to China to get the all the stuff they wanted, and they were seeing their treasury being depleted,、mm-hmm. and the British don't like that.、Mm-hmm. So somebody, some smart guy, goes, "Listen, why don't we force the Chinese to take opium?" Well, they had laws against opium. Okay, well, the British did it. They fought two wars, forced opium down the gullet of、They、the Chinese. C- called the Opium Wars. Two Opium Wars. Yeah. All right. And China was addicted. The British came in, established trading concessions all up and down the rivers. All, all the Western countries came in there.、Mm-hmm. We called it the Chinese open door policy. You know what that's tantamount? Well, the the girls the girls over there are all getting raped. We're late to the party, and and they're, they're stopping us at the door. We go, hey, everybody should have access to these girls. That's the United States. That's what the United States policy was: open door to China, because they got there late. The British were there, the Germans were there, the French were there, and the Americans, who was just a new country, got there damn late. All right. So you know we were bitching. This isn't free trade. We should get access too. Yeah. It was just brutal, brute power. All right. Now, sure, a lot of good things happen, but this is. How they happen,、mm-hmm. and the British did it because they had a huge amount of leverage with their paper so, money. So, and in effect, they were using opium as a currency. Yes, or, or were no, they, no, they, no, they no, were no. forcing the Chinese to, to buy opium. opium, and they were and and to take their currency along with it. Once, once, once they got the Chinese addicted. Once they busted. Once they broke down the Chinese resistance. Everybody talks about the opium. The big deal was China was forced to accept their paper money. Okay, that was really it.、Mm-hmm. China was on its knees, and now paper money was all over Asia. Now, when did paper money screw up? Because as long as you could keep, as long as you can keep money, credit and debt is a dynamic, unstable system. Why is it dynamic and unstable? Because the amount of debt and the amount of credit and the ratio between the two is always changing. All right, and it cannot function unless it's always growing. Why? Because when money is issued in the form of credit, it turns into it, it turns into debt immediately and has to throw off a, a revenue interest. Yeah. All right, and it doesn't end until the debt's retired.、Mm-hmm. Until it's retired, and it compounds daily. Yeah. So you may issue a million dollars in credit, but it's going to return to the banker three million dollars. You buy a house. A million dollar house, Jeffrey. You're going to end up paying over a thirty year loan. What twenty million dollars? I mean, over compounding interest over thirty years. Now, I have heard people say that the real problem with debt
is that the interest is always higher than the rate of growth of the economy. So the economy can never Screw keep that up. Okay. Screw those people. Yeah? It, it's deeper than that. Yeah? It's, that's, it, that's implying there's a way to fix it. Mm-hmm. That you can fix the interest rate lower than the speed of the economy. Yeah. The interest rate operates differently off the speed of the economy. Okay. There's no, nobody's trying to make the thing grow fast. Now they are because they're obsessed with the, the engine dying. Yeah. The interest rate is a function of the market and the central banks. Central banks lower the interest rate when they want to goose the market, and they raise it when they want to slow it down. This, what we call the business cycle, never happened until the central bankers came in. Why does, and now we think this, the business cycle is like the seasons. Oh. It slows, it goes down, it goes into expansion, it goes into recession. It's like the season. Well, you get the, the idea of the business say, cycle going back to uh, Joseph's dreams in the Bible. No. There was, those were changing, those were changing conditions. Yeah. But the business cycle that we see of expansion and contraction is different than Joseph's dreams. Okay. It's, it's Abraham's nightmare. <laughs> How's that? Because once you artificially induce economic growth, art, because it's credit is an artificial induction of demand. Yeah. It expands and then it's got to pay off that extra, dem- up to right. that extra debt and it can't do it because mm-hmm. it was artificial. So it contracts. Yeah. People go broke, they clean it up, it goes back to normal mm-hmm. until they get manipulated because they never want the contraction. You know why we haven't had a deep contraction since the 70s? Reagan, because the boys own the central bankers and they want, they got to keep it expanding. Yeah. We are now in the end game of the game. Okay. Let's, let's, let's calm, calm down. <laughs> calm, let's calm down and, and, and let's uh, recapitulate this because I think what I heard you just say is that the uh, financial crisis of 2008 isn't the end of it. No, not at all. Not at all. By the time the 2008 rolled around, I knew we were in trouble. I knew we were in trouble in a way we'd never been before. And the precursor to this was the 19, the collapse of the Nikkei in 1990. All right. I remember Krugman. I don't like Krugman. I like his heart. I don't like his economics. Mm -hmm. All right. But that, but that doesn't put me up with the right wing boys. I don't like their lack of heart. I think they got, most of them have a better view, better grasp of economics than the ones on the left, Mm -hmm. but they have no heart. Mm -hmm. All right. And you're going to die that way. All right. So you got this ideological balance. And Krugman is writing during the 1990s, I think we have a whiff of the 1930s in the air. Mm-hmm. They were so arrogant about their ability to keep their system running, they thought what happened by fate and fortune was up to them. That's how arrogant. There's Jeffrey, are you familiar with the book um, The Great Wave? No. <sighs> You will love this book. Mm-hmm. The Great Way was published in 1996 by David Hackett Fisher. He's a professor, okay? And he wrote about the history of Western civilization um, in, in terms of epics, mm-hmm. all right? Uh, Middle Ages, um, the, the Renaissance, succeeded by the Renaissance, succeeded by the Age of Enlightenment, mm-hmm. succeeded by the Victorian Age of, of what he called, and now we were in another age, right? He's, he's, he's a historian. Okay. And what he did was this, is that it was all about interest rates. Okay? He said, of all the things that we have, financial data, we have the oldest city. We know how much wheat costs or cotton at the age of at when when uh, Caesar ruled Rome. Mm-hmm. We have a record. Yeah. Okay? And so what these records show up is waves. Yes. Okay? What he said was this. What we know is, is that what we've seen from the historian's point of view is that you have periods of stasis, of relative stability and calm and well-being. All of but he said, however, these periods of relative stability are always interrupted. Always interrupted by what he calls a wave of inflation. Mm-hmm. He calls these great waves. They come along every 140 to 200 years and totally bring that civilization, that epoch, to its knees. I mean, knees. And he talked about, this is what happened in the Middle Ages. You know, stability of the church, uh, land ownership, and then all of a sudden, at the period of absolute stability, what they consider stable, you had disease, prices started rising, just things started going wrong. 
Yeah. Until it collapsed with the Black Plague and, and totally, and then all of a sudden, Renaissance came along. Mm-hmm. But seen from his point of view, and then we had stability and the flowering of the arts. Mm-hmm. And then around 150 years later, interest rates started rising. Okay? That collapsed. So he saw these waves, intervening waves of prosperity and total chaos that presaged deep change. Mm-hmm. Deep change. All right? David Hackett Fisher wrote this book in 1996, Oxford University Press. Quite a prestigious house. Mm-hmm. Half the book is footnotes. Okay? Serious book. Yeah. And what he said was this. The relative stability of what he called the age of, he called it the age of Victorian stability. I called it the age of central banking. <laughs> okay? Relative stability. He said this age started changing in 1896. Okay? And he says it's been building ever since, this great wave. In 1996, when he wrote this book, he said, the, the function of change is greater than it's ever been in history. We are now at a level of change within change at a magnitude we have never encountered before. That's for sure. Okay. I mean, you can see it everywhere. And he wrote this in 1996 mm-hmm. from purely an economic historian's point of view. Yeah. Okay. But, but there are many, many... Science. It's now, 30 years later, we're going, holy shit, what's new? What was evident to me in the 1970s, okay. the speed of transportation, okay. the speed of communication, Everything the speed of knowledge, okay. Okay. Was, was, they were all growing on a, a logarithmic scale. scale. Well, what he said was this, is that this is building into the greatest wave ever of destruction. Yeah. And they always happen be- after around 140, and we're deep into it now. Yeah. We are deep into it. And he had a little metaphor in the beginning about the person looking at the change who thinks he's the change agent, who thinks they have the ability to foresee and shape the future. Mm. He says they are basically... This is a different, in a canoe on a tsunami of huge proportions. Mm-hmm. Okay? And you would you will like David Hackett Fisher's book. Okay. And so when I read that book, I go, wow. All right? Because I understood it. Because he even talked about inflation and deflation in this thing. Mm-hmm. What happens is this, Jeffrey, is that when they can no longer induce sufficient growth with credit, because they have to. The economy has to grow enough to pay off the debts. Right, 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 and and because we've only been at this for a couple hundred years, and it gets cleaned out every once. Everybody thinks, oh, it's it's just like the body. Mm-hmm. The body gets healthy, gets sick, and it, it stays healthy. In other words, <laughs> if I can pursue that metaphor yeah. a bit, it's like uh, when the body sloughs off cells, dead cells, and the like. It's, it's good like for it. companies going bankrupt. Yeah, exactly. Well, they tried that in the thirties, mm-hmm. and it died. What people don't know is the economy died. And Bucky saw this. See, I read yeah. Bucky's book, Critical Path, just talked exactly what happened in the 1930s. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't for the con game of home ownership and the and the socialization of Wall Street with with taxpayer, all the rich people hate FDR. Basically, FDR brought them to task because they caused the crash. And then he basically backed all their assets with the taxpayers and asked nothing for a return. Well, they put, as I understand it, hundreds, maybe thousands of bankers in jail. They put a few. Yeah. They put a few in. Mm-hmm. In the 30s. Yeah. And basically handed them back the system and and the bullshit that went along with it. We recovered after the war. Okay? And we've been on this thing ever since. Right. 1990 was a crash in the economic system unlike anything since the 1930s. I mean, it. Japan lost 80% of its value and property, stock market, and it didn't recover for decades. Mm-hmm. And it only has been ambulatory because of huge government support since then. Over half the stocks in Japan are owned by the government. The Japanese were the first to go to zero interest rates. And Japan is still on its knees. They were saved in the interim from a deflationary collapse by the vast expansion of first the United States and China, 
which put a huge demand on Japanese exports. They live by exports. Those exports have gone negative for the last year and a half. Japan, China is, is gone down. The United States has gone down. Japan is cooked. It's cooked. They're, they're cooked. So when I, when, when I wrote my prediction about where we were, I used Japan as our canary in the coal mine. Mm-hmm. And they, they've been living on what I call artificial pr- price, artificial central bank support since then. Central bank support, which is cheap interest rates and QE, is like steroids. It's like giving steroids to the system to keep it alive. Now, it's good because the system doesn't die, which it would have unless you were giving it steroids. Mm-hmm. But last week, I read a great description of it by a banker. And this is what he said. You know, he said, steroids work for a while. And eventually, your bones turn to dust. You'll die from steroids. You will die from steroids alone. All right? They will save you in the short term. In the long term, they're going to kill you. Now, this is what we've got. And this is why people don't realize what's going on in the repo markets right now. All right? I don't know if you... Do you know what's going on in the repo markets? No, tell me. I'm not even sure what the repo markets are Are that you're referring referring to. to. And it's because when I went to Europe in 2007 to speak... Antal asked me to speak at his conference on gold Mm -hmm. in Hungary. And and that was when Hoyt, the psychic, had come that year and said, you're going to be speaking before a group of thinkers. He told Martha and I this in like April. Mm -hmm. Thinkers. We had no idea. We weren't going anywhere. In June, we get an invitation from Antal to go to Hungary and for me to talk at his conference there. So there we are in Hungary at this monastery. Give me this talk. There's no Mm Wi-Fi. But we know something's going on because we have computers downstairs that are hooked up to the internet. And all of the, the 30 of us who are there from around the world, all right, are down there looking glued to these computer terminals because we know something's going on and we don't quite know what it means. Mm-hmm. Credit markets were contracting. What year is this? 2007. Mm-hmm. Credit markets were contracting all over the world. Yeah. All right. Yeah. What we don't know is, we found out later, that central bankers had to come in with tens of millions of dollars to re- keep the credit markets functioning. Mm-hmm. They were in crisis. Yeah. To keep a cl- crash from happening. Yeah. The crash happened anyway. Yeah. One year later. Right. Okay, now. That's a credit, that's a liquidity intervention in the markets by the central banks. That would happen in 2007. It happened again September 15th. For the first time in 10 years almost. You mean this year? This year. Mm-hmm. You don't know about it. No. Because they don't want anybody to know about it. Yeah. They want everybody to feel good. Mm-hmm. Because when you feel good, you're going to borrow stuff and invest and keep going. Sure. All right? And, yeah. and th- their, their game is just to keep the deal going. Yeah. Not to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. All right? They don't, want the ch- they don't want to scare the chickens on the farms. Well, what happened is on uh, February 20th, the uh, Fed had to come in overnight and p- provide emergency lending to... The banks. Emergency. Now, banks generally borrow from each other. Yeah. Central banks loan to the banks and lend at very cheap interest rates. The banks take this money and they make bets on all these bonds. All That's why they have so much money. Yeah. Because they get it cheaper. They have, the, they have the ability to leverage that you and I don't have. Right. And they're able to make money out of money. Right. Like nobody else can. Yeah. Okay. What happened is there's called the Fed window. All right. For the first time in, in decades, people went, the feds went to the Fed window for the repo market. What's the repo market? Repo markets are what, when, it, when, you're, when you're backed up against the wall, I call this uh, payday lending. Mm-hmm. You know, you sell signs, payday loans? Yeah, sure. These are the payday loans for the banks. All right. right? They can go to the Fed right. and give them treasuries or IOUs, which is a treasury, sure. and cash out. Mm-hmm. The Fed will give them cash on the barrel head and wait for the bank to for maturity to give that thing back mm-hmm. at below market rates. Now, if you and I need money or the people who go to the real payday loans, then we're charged up to here. Yeah. But the Fed gives it to them at below market rates. Right. Why? Because they want to keep the game going. Yeah. Not, this has nothing to do with integrity. Well, what happened is interest rates, overnight interest rates started sparking, going over 10%. They try and keep them at two. 
It, overnight, it hit 10. When? On, on February 20th, this year. This year? Yes. Interest rates up over 10%? In the repo market. Okay. okay. You don't see it. Calm down. Okay. In the repo market. <laughs> Only in the repo market. Okay. So the Fed stepped in and provided probably $80 billion of instant capital to all these people, and they won't even tell who's at the window, because mm-hmm. they don't want us to know who's needing them, mm-hmm. or for what. And so, they did it overnight. People go, wow, this is the first time in years. Now, why it got me was, 10 years before, I was in Hungary watching the same thing, mm-hmm. and didn't know what it was then. Right. Now I know, because I've mm-hmm. been watching it for, ten, for so years. So, 10 years ago, uh, it, it happened... Uh, in Europe. Right before the big crash. This a bank called... Um, um, a bank called AKB, a German bank. See, in the 1930s, the crash happened in Europe because of a Rothschild bank, Credit Anstalt, in Austria, could not meet its obligations. All right, and the Rothschilds didn't. But they had the, they owned the bank, but they weren't going to bail their bank out because banks leveraged their money to the nth degree, so they owed 50 times what the bank owed. Mm-hmm. And they were going to come in and pay off the leverage. Yeah. So it was up to the governments. Mm-hmm. Well, the French hated the Germans and the Austrians. They hated, you know, that European crap. Yeah. All right? So they had to get them to agree to the bailout, and the French wouldn't. So Credit Anstalt went down and took the whole banking system with it. That was in the 30s. What happened this time, a German bank called IKB, which had a portfolio of subprime U.S. loans that had just gone to crap, Mm -hmm. could not meet its obligations. And this time, the European banking system stepped in and gave it an emergency line of credit. Okay. So they went into it and provided them below market loans, repo loans, Mm -hmm. whatever they can give them. And they they made earlier this year. No, this is 19, 2007. That's oh, how I knew what happened. Oh, okay. But in, earlier this year, yeah. a like event happened, but it's obfuscated with smoke and mirrors. They don't say who went to the window, but they had to report what happened. Mm-hmm. The window was open. They were forced because interest rates went over 10, up to 10% that night. Mm-hmm. They came in and flooded the repo market with more money to drive the interest rates back down. The repo market is the payday loan for banks. Okay. All right? That only banks get it. Mm -hmm. You and I don't. Mm -hmm. Only that, and only a handful of banks get it. The primary dealers. So what happened is, is in September of this year, the repo markets tightened up. They didn't tell us. I I know because I watch this stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. And everyone's going, well, why did the Fed have to come in? The banks have all this liquidity. Yeah. They have, they're, they're not, and they're saying, oh, because we have this regulation, and if you let us, that's crap. They're just trying to get less rules on them. Mm-hmm. What, the last thing I heard about it was this. The repo market started seizing up because the hedge funds were trying, were pressed to the wall. The withdrawal of hedge funds has run into the hundreds of billions of dollars. Withdrawal from hedge from funds. Hedge, yeah. yeah, because everybody's afraid of exposure to today's markets. Mm-hmm. All right? Mm-hmm. And the smartest people, the biggest people, have their money on the biggest bettors in the hedge funds. Yeah. So they've asked the hedge funds to give their money back. Well, the hedge funds have all these positions, and they can't unwind like that. Right. Takes time. And when they do unwind the position, they got to sell their position, and who are they going to sell it to? To another hedge fund? Or maybe themselves. And as all, they're all trying to exit the highly leveraged trades, the prices plunge. Mm-hmm. And the banks are afraid of their exposure. Mm-hmm. So the banks aren't loaning to the hedge funds. The latest scuttlebutt may be only the Fed is loaning to the hedge funds now. So what you're saying is we're going through a scenario right now at this moment, as we're speaking, as, we speak. as we're speaking, as we're speaking, which is Albuquerque, which is uh, parallel to what happened in the 1930s, parallel to what happened in, in 2008. 2008 in Japan in, two, in 1990 and in 2008. Except it's worse because we're further out on the limb. Yeah, there's been more money paid put into it to try and save the system. They've printed more huge amounts of credit. Yeah. There's huge amounts floating around. We now have negative interest rates. We never had negative interest rates before. We've had negative interest rates for tw- for two years in Europe. Mm-hmm. First in Japan, now in Europe, and it's starting to come here. 
That is a sign that you've printed way too much money. Yeah. All right. And it's starting to affect us. So we're here in a highly volatile position. And the repo market is a sign of systemic distress. The system is under pressure. Now, Jeffrey, I watch this stuff. Not because I'm a hippie. Because I heard those words and started watching it and learned everything mm-hmm. from scratch for my own. And I believe that we are at the end of a game. The game cannot expand fast enough and long enough. Cheap credit no longer makes makes demand grow. We're caught in a deflationary cycle that's ultimately fatal. A deflationary cycle is when demand collapses, prices collapse, and the only thing that's going to be left holding the bag is the governments. The governments are going to print money just to keep us afloat. Just to keep mm-hmm. us functioning. Yep. All right? And they're going to keep, they're going to first of all try and save the banks because without the banks, they can't get loans themselves. All right. It's like, you know, that's how it is. Yeah. So you and I and everybody else, we're caught in a game bigger than us. And to me, I'm, I'm really a disaffected person. I really am disaffected. And I watch this happen and I go, you know what? Bucky was, Buck Minister Fuller was absolutely right. He says, this era has to end before a better era begins. And in 1981, he wrote a book called Critical Path. And he said, what's going to happen is this. All the power structures, economic, political, and religious, are going to collapse. They're all going to collapse. And out of the collapse may come a better world, depending on us, Mm -hmm. depending on humanity. Are we going to respond with a higher level of us? or lower level with us. And Bucky said, unless we respond with a higher level of us, the universe is going to toss us aside. He said, because our function in the universe is no longer going to be fulfilled. Bucky said, humanity's function is a localized problem solver. We're able to see things at a local a localization and fix it. That's what we are. He said, but we've only made things worse. We've, we've destroyed our home planet. All right, we we polluted the air. We not polluted the water. We polluted. Well, everything. Bucky was something of an optimist, as I recall. That's the Bucky you know. Yeah, he was an optimist. Bucky said, optimistically, there's enough for everybody. Mm-hmm. That's optimistic. And I knew about Bucky being an optimist. I I thought he was naive mm-hmm. when it came to reality. Yeah. This is what Bucky said in his book. I made very sure that my predictions were fifty years in the future. Because I didn't want to draw the attention of the power structures that would then perceive me as a threat. Okay? Mm -hmm. He knew that what he was seeing and what he was proposing for a better world would threaten the power structures. He knew that. So he said, I kept all my predictions 50 years out. And so they used me. They would bring me in and have the newspapers talk to me. And I was sort of a caricature, a sort of funny guy who said these great ideas that everybody loved. In 1981, he wrote his final book called Critical Path. And he said, mankind is entering a period of, of whether it, whether it is going to be survive or not. He said, our very survival is at stake. All right. Our mm-hmm. survival is at stake. Mm-hmm. And he said, this is a choice that's not going to be made politically, spirit, you know, or religiously or, or money wise. It's going to be up to each and every one of us. And whether we respond with this, how do we respond to this question? Do you want the benefit of everyone else on the planet as much as you want your own well-being? Do you want the well-being of your fellow man as much as you want your own? He said that is the question that humanity is going to have to answer at a personal level in the coming crisis. This crisis is going to be unprecedented in scope and a magnitude, which fits right in with David Hackett Fisher's prediction of what's going on, which fits right in with what we're seeing with the dissolution of political, economic, and religious systems. We see it happening around us. Bucky saw this in 1981. Grunch of Giants. It was published posthumously. Mm -hmm. And it's basically Elizabeth Warren's playbook. She knows the threat of corporations. Bucky basically said multinational corporations drained America's wealth, took it offshore, and now are leaving the carcass to die. Well, what an interesting note to end on. <laughs> like I said, Jeffrey, my audiences for the past 10 years have been highly polarized between men and women. Mm-hmm. On the spiritual side, Martha and I go to these things, oh, my, oh, and 90% women. 
Mm. All these great lot of huggings, a lot of love. Yeah. The other ninety percent was where I was in Vegas mm. when you when we, yeah. come, we went out there. Ninety percent man, hard money. The government's going to do it to us. Paranoia. Mm-hmm. So we I, we split our time between these two people. Well, two weeks ago, I was it was my turn for my temple talk, mm. and I talked about Bucky and what he said was going on, and this is what I did. I said, you know what? I didn't want to leave everybody here in a lurch, and they're all women. I said, but listen, what can I tell you? you? You chose to be here at this time for a reason. You are the change agents, and we're either going to make it or not make it because of you who have chosen to come here. So woman up. <laughs> and the women went nuts. You know? Yeah. They went nuts. Because it's all women. It was basically 90% women in spiritual church. Yeah. So I looked at her and said, Woman up. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl Schoon, what a pleasure. What an informative conversation. And uh, we are going to do one more while you're okay. here in Albuquerque. We'll get into the whole question of conspiracy theories. Oh, my. I'm stepping dear to my heart. Thank you for being with me. Thank Darryl. you for asking me, mm-hmm. Jeffrey. My pleasure. My. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.